Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The iconic Dutch colonial-style building at 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville is best known today for the extraordinary account of a haunting at the house in 1976. The Amityville Horror, as it was soon known, became one of the most famous incidents of paranormal activity ever recorded. It would inspire a book and a successful series of Hollywood films. The account of the young Lutz family being tormented by demonic pigs, plagues of flies and green slime oozing from the walls terrified readers and moviegoers, all the more so because it was labeled as a true story. One surprisingly little-known fact about the Amityville Horror is that it was an admitted hoax. George Lutz and his wife Kathy invented the haunting with the help of lawyer and literary agent William Weber. But the paranormal version obscures a very real horror, one far more frightening and mysterious than the fanciful tales of poltergeists Hollywood gave the world. Because in the same house, less than two years earlier, one of the strangest and most baffling of mass murders in recent history occurred. And the true events may not be the story that you're familiar with. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… We've all heard of the Headless Horseman, but Sleepy Hollow's lesser-known ghost will terrify you all the more. Theodore Roosevelt was so tough that during one of his speeches he was shot in the chest, but still kept going until his speech was over. And then there was Alice, his daughter, who may have been even tougher than Teddy. An icy cold hand caresses a girl in the middle of the night. For most people, spotting a UFO would be considered extremely unusual. But for two Ohio women, seeing a UFO was the least surprising part of their experience. These stories and more in this episode of Weird Darkness. But first, was there another gunman in the notorious Amityville House murders? We'll begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The first sign that something was terribly wrong in the picturesque Suffolk County coastal village of Amityville came at around 6.30 p.m. when a frantic local resident named Ronnie Butch DeFeo Jr. burst into Henry's bar with a shocking story. "'You gotta help me!' he yelled. "'I think my mother and father are shot!' Several of the bar's patrons immediately rushed to the house where they were hit with the stench of death. DeFeo's mother and father were both shot in their beds. Worse still, four of their children had been slaughtered as well. One of them, Joe Yeswit, called the Suffolk County Police with the awful news. On their arrival, a search of the house confirmed the worst. Every member of the DeFeo family, save for Butch, were dead. The victims were Ronald DeFeo Sr., 43, Louise DeFeo, 42, and four of their children, Dawn, 18, Allison, 13, Mark, 12, and John Matthew, 9. 
Each of them had been shot, execution-style, at close range as they slept, and all six were found laying in their beds, face down on their stomachs. As police trawled the house, the lone survivor, Butch DeFeo, cut a forlorn figure outside, refusing to go in. DeFeo mentioned to officers that he felt a mob hitman was responsible for the killings, a suggestion taken seriously because of the methodical way the family seemed to have been killed. DeFeo was taken into police custody for his own protection, but didn't stick to his mob story for very long. Within 24 hours, the surviving DeFeo had made a shocking confession. He had murdered his family himself. Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast, DeFeo told stunned detectives. After the murders, he admitted he took a shower, changed his clothes, and disposed of the murder weapon. With a full confession, the subsequent investigation seemed straightforward. At around 3.15 a.m., November 13, Butch DeFeo had awoken and for reasons that may forever remain unclear, took a 35 caliber Marlin rifle and systematically shot all six members of his family. But even some of the detectives, keen to quickly wrap up their biggest ever murder case, could see there was something very wrong with this story. How had Butch shot six people in four different rooms without any of them waking up? How had no neighbors heard the rifle blasts? If everyone was shot in bed, how had blood splatter got on the floor and a dresser? Many had begun to feel Butch could not have acted alone. Unburnt gunshot residue on DeFeo's sister Dawn even indicated she might have been involved. Were there other gunmen in the DeFeo family massacre? At the subsequent trial, Ronald DeFeo Jr. proved to be a terrible witness. His story constantly changed, and his erratic and strange behavior alienated him to everyone. He even threatened to kill the judge and his own lawyer. On November 21, 1975, he was found guilty on six counts of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to six concurrent 25-year sentences, although he is unlikely to ever be released. But despite the conviction, it was clear there was a serious problem with the official story. The court had determined that DeFeo had acted alone, killing all six members of his family with a 35-gauge Marlin rifle. DeFeo had supposedly shot each victim as they slept, and both prosecution and defense agreed he had not used a silencer. How had DeFeo committed the shooting alone without any of his family waking up? Defense experts had conducted an experiment on the Marlin rifle and found its report was so loud that it could be heard almost a mile away. According to the autopsy and ballistic reports, each victim was shot as they were found, face down in their beds. It seemed none of them had been awoken by the shots, and none had put up any kind of struggle or tried to hide or flee the scene. Ken Grigowski, the former Amityville police chief, was one of the first law enforcement professionals at the scene. To this day, he finds it hard to believe DeFeo could have committed the shootings without any members of his family waking up. Why someone wasn't able to get out of that house is beyond belief, he later said. What made this particularly inexplicable was the locations of the six bodies strongly suggesting DeFeo could not have committed the shootings so rapidly that nobody had time to react. In fact, DeFeo had fired a total of eight ear-shredding shots, estimated to be 140 decibels each, in four different rooms of the sprawling house, across two different floors, and yet it seems he had not disturbed anyone. Nor did any neighbors hear the shots. 112 Ocean Avenue was not an isolated property. It was surrounded quite closely by other homes. When police interviewed the residents, nobody reported hearing anything except the barking of the DeFeo family dog. Dr. Howard Adelman, deputy chief medical examiner of Suffolk County, was present at the crime scene and personally conducted the autopsies of the DeFeo family. He testified at the trial that he felt it was impossible for one person to have committed the crimes. 
Even if they were sleeping, the report of the weapon that was used is supposed to be so loud that it would have, so to speak, awakened the dead, he said. And neither had any of the victims been drugged. We did extensive toxicology, not only on the blood and urine, but on all of the organs that we removed, and it turned up zero that there wasn't anything in their body, Adelman explained. The idea that Butch DeFeo had committed the crimes on his own was becoming increasingly untenable. Even the man who secured DeFeo's 25-to-life prison sentence for the crimes, prosecutor Gerard Sullivan, long suspected that other shooters had to be involved. I wonder about the questions that were never answered. Did any of the victims wake up? If so, why didn't any of them defend themselves? Why were all six found face down in death? Why didn't anyone hear the shots?" he wrote in his book, High Hopes, in 1981. If then, as seemed likely, DeFeo had not acted alone, who had helped him commit this horrifying crime? Several investigators and authors have suggested Butch DeFeo's oldest sister, Dawn, played some part in the shootings. The first five victims were on the second floor of the DeFeo house. Ronald Sr. and mother, Louise DeFeo, were both shot twice in the master bedroom. Moving across to the other side of the house, the gunman then shot the two boys, Mark and John. Completing the second floor of shootings, 13-year-old Allison DeFeo was shot once in the head. That's a total of seven shots, at 140 decibels each, before the gunman even started to ascend the stairs to Don DeFeo's third-floor bedroom. It is therefore unthinkable that Dawn, entirely unsedated or drugged, would not already have been alerted to a gunman before they had even arrived on the third floor. Yet, as we have seen, she appeared to be peacefully asleep, face down in her bed, having made no attempt to escape, defend herself, or hide. Had Dawn, as some suspected, actually participated in the shooting herself? only to then be shot by her brother and placed in her bed. Although Butch DeFeo is notorious for the sheer number of contradictory stories he has told about the murders over the years, one of his more consistent accounts is, indeed, that Dawn did take part in the killings. In most versions of his story, he has claimed responsibility for the murder of his mother and father and showed little remorse for them, but he has often blamed Dawn for killing the family's children. Mark, John, and Allison. After discovering what she had done, DeFeo says he then killed Dawn after a struggle with the rifle. Some evidence does exist to tentatively support this scenario. Dawn seems to have been killed somewhere other than her bed and placed there after her death. Crime scene investigators discovered that Dawn had suffered a huge head wound and that brain matter and blood was on her pillow, bedclothes, and nightgown yet her white headboard just inches from her head was pristine. The lack of blood splatter was strongly indicative that she had been shot somewhere else. Blood splatter was also found on a dresser and floorboards in the house, again demonstrating the possibility at least some of the shootings had occurred away from the beds. Some investigators have speculated that unburnt gunshot residue found on Don's body indicated she might have handled a firearm or ammunition, although the prosecution expert at the trial, Alfred De La Pena, thought this could have occurred as a result of the muzzle flash when Dawn was shot. Rick Moran, amongst the first group of reporters at the scene that night the bodies were discovered, had studied the DeFeo murders for more than 30 years. He is sure that Dawn was involved in some way. Moran cites one of Butch DeFeo's strangest claims amongst his many conflicting statements as evidence. DeFeo has said several times that on the night of the shootings, he was watching TV in a drug-induced haze when a strange black hooded figure came to him and handed him a rifle and urged him to commit the murders. Moran thinks this figure could have been Dawn. According to the reporter, Dawn was often spotted by neighbors wearing a black snorkel-style coat, which may have led a heavily stoned butch to mistake her for a sinister figure. Although clearly highly anecdotal, Moran says one of his contacts at the Drug Enforcement Agency backs up the story. He had told Moran that someone from the DEA 
actually had the house under surveillance the night of the murders due to a suspicion that Butch had been smuggling drugs in his speedboat. This DEA agent has supposedly observed Dawn in her black coat leaving the house with a rifle, getting into a car, and driving off in the direction the firearm was subsequently found by the police. If Dawn and Butch plotted the murders together, could Butch's incapacity due to heavy drug use have spurred Dawn to commit them herself? And once Butch had come down, had he shot Dawn after the horror of what she had done dawned on him? On the face of it, this scenario seems far-fetched, but it does help explain many of the puzzling and intractable issues with the crime scene, and evidence from the trial indicates Dawn's mindset may have been disturbed enough to make her taking such extreme actions seem at least plausible. Dawn's boyfriend, William DeVidge, stated to the court that Dawn was a habitual user of LSD and mescaline, and had recently started to become extremely hostile toward her parents because they had refused to allow her to live with him. The DeFeo family were by all accounts dysfunctional and troubled, and Ronald DeFeo Sr. was reported to be particularly violent, controlling, and abusive to both his wife and children, all commonly cited factors in patricide. Butch DeFeo has given several different versions of the murders in which people other than Don DeFeo were part of the conspiracy but with little or no evidence to support them, Dawn remains the most likely candidate for an extra shooter. In the hours following the shooting, when police interviewed local Amityville residents, many told the detectives they felt Butch DeFeo was responsible. Considering the reputation DeFeo had developed in the sleepy community, it was not so surprising that residents immediately felt he had committed the atrocity. Over the years, he was continually in trouble for his thuggish and erratic behavior, theft, and drug abuse. During the run-up to the murders, DeFeo's drug-taking had become particularly acute. By his own admission, he was consuming huge amounts of heroin and marijuana and drinking a bottle of scotch every day, despite already being on probation for drug crimes at the time. His violence was also spiraling out of control. At the trial, much testimony was offered for DeFeo's temper and obsession with guns. One witness recalled how DeFeo had held a shotgun up at the head of a young man during a hunting party and watched stony-faced as the man turned white with fear. On another occasion, DeFeo held a 12-gauge shotgun up against his own father's head during an argument and even pulled the trigger. The shotgun failed to fire, and DeFeo Sr. reportedly found religion soon afterwards. Psychologists subsequently diagnosed Butch as having antisocial personality disorder, displaying little or no empathy for other people. Some speculated that DeFeo's many different accounts of the murders were attempts to shift blame for the deaths of his siblings to anyone but himself. Whilst DeFeo showed no feelings for his mother and detested his father, he would always become agitated and upset when talking about the deaths of his brothers and little sister. If he could successfully convince others, and perhaps even himself, that someone else had killed the children, it may have helped to assuage his own guilt about the murders. One of the major problems with the multiple gunmen scenario is the testimony of the prosecution's ballistics experts who stated all of the wounds to the six victims were made with the same firearm. A study of the wounds to the DeFeo family and the expended cartridges found at the crime scene indicate eight shots had been fired. All eight shell casings were found and forensically linked to a single 35 caliber Marlin rifle found by police thrown in the dock directly behind the house. Although Herman Race, an experienced criminologist hired by the defense, disputed this ballistic evidence, it seemed quite conclusive. But it did little to reconcile the enduring and seemingly intractable contradictions in the case. To this day, no truly satisfactory account of what happened has ever been offered. Butch DeFeo is no help, seemingly lost in his own miasma of lies and delusions, and everyone else who is there is dead. All we know for sure is that six lives were destroyed, seven if you count Butch DeFeo, who will surely die in prison. Whatever happened that horrible night in Amityville, the truth may forever be lost 
amidst fictional stories of ghosts and demons. Up next, we've all heard of the Headless Horseman, but Sleepy Hollow's lesser-known ghost will terrify you all the more. Teddy Roosevelt was so tough that during one of his speeches he was shot in the chest and kept speaking until his speech was over, and that's nothing compared to his tough daughter Alice. And an icy cold hand caresses a girl in the middle of the night. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, April 13th. Are all the men gathered? All the fools. We'll be treated to a Roger Corman crap fest from 1958. Teenage Caveman, starring Robert Vaughn. There are shadows there, deep and cold, and dirt that eats men. Did he just say dirt that eats men? There are shadows there, deep and cold, and dirt that eats men. Yep, I guess so. Mistress Malicious and her Mistress Peace Theater will keep us entertained throughout the film as we watch this caveman teenager with great hair go into the jungle to fight prehistoric monsters like, um, dogs and, and uh, an armadillo. Whatever. They're prehistoric creatures. An animal's far more terrible than any you've seen. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the movie. We could make a place to lie down on. Plus, during this Weirdo Watch Party, I'll be giving away a creepy crate to one lucky winner full of scary surprises like horror collectibles, true crime-themed accessories, books, terrifying trinkets, and more, with some Weird Darkness swag added in. You won't know what's in the creepy crate until you open it. Strengthening his courage, his daring, his dreams. And I'll be giving instructions on how to win the creepy crate inside the chat during the movie, so you have to tune in to win. It's Teenage Caveman, Saturday, April 13th, hosted by Mistress Peace Theater. See the awe-inspiring beasts in a teenage caveman's world. The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night, on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. Hope to see you on Saturday, April 13th. Many travelers come to Sleepy Hollow in search of its best-known spirit, the Headless Horseman, made famous by Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. However, these ghost seekers may not be aware of a second local legend, which has haunted the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery for over 100 years – the Bronze Lady. Larger than life and cast in bronze, the towering statue watches over the mausoleum of Civil War General Samuel Thomas. Though her rather sleepy visage appears more sad than threatening, legend says that at night she comes to life and wanders the cemetery grounds, terrifying anyone who may have entered on a dare. According to lore, as you get closer to the Bronze Lady, you'll hear her weeping. If you knock on the door to the General's mausoleum once or three times depending on whose instructions you follow, you'll have bad dreams that night. Finally. If you dare to approach and sit in the Bronze Lady's lap, she'll allegedly cry tears of blood. If you further insult the statue, say by hitting it in the face, you will be cursed for life. Thrill-seeking visitors have been known to run screaming from the cemetery after a supposed encounter with the Bronze Lady. The statue was commissioned by General Thomas's widow upon his death in 1903. A prominent sculptor of the time, Andrew O'Connor Jr., created the lady. Jesse Phoebe Brown, O'Connor's muse and mistress, modeled for the statue. Though the Bronze Lady is one of the more popular monuments in Sleepy Hollow's cemetery, the widow who commissioned it was not so happy with the finished product. She told O'Connor that she had hoped for something more gay, a rather odd request for a statue meant for a mausoleum. So, O'Connor cast another, happier head. 
but as soon as Mrs. Thomas told him she liked it, he smashed it on the floor, telling her, I just made this to show you that I could do it. I should never let such a monstrosity out of my studio. As for the bronze lady's supposed supernatural powers, some Sleepy Hollow locals claimed to have tempted fate when they were younger by insulting the statue. They never suffered a curse. But Emily Storms Arminio, a 10th generation Sleepy Hollow native, said her grandmother told her if you touch the bronze lady on the face and say a prayer, either something very good or very bad will happen. I scoffed at the tale, Aminio told the New York Times, but two days after I touched the bronze lady's face, a storm brought down a tree limb that crushed my Camaro. Approach the bronze lady yourself at your own peril in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, located in Sleepy Hollow, New York. On October 14, 1912, former American president, as well as cowboy, adventurer, soldier, and New York police commissioner Theodore Roosevelt was shot in the chest while giving a speech in Milwaukee and just kept right on talking. Angry about the way that America had been run since he left office, he decided to run again for president as the Progressive Party candidate. While campaigning, he was shot by John Schrank, a mentally unbalanced New York saloon keeper who was opposed to Roosevelt running for a third time, which was allowed but frowned upon in those days. Even after being shot, Roosevelt went right along with his speech and even laughed, it takes more than one bullet to kill a bull moose. And from that point on, the Progressive Party was nicknamed the Bull Moose Party in honor of the former Rough Rider. As a side note, Theodore Roosevelt was so tough he kept the bullet in his chest for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, though, he did lose the election. But one has to wonder if all of his adventures in Africa and the Amazon, his charge up San Juan Hill, and even getting shot in the chest were as terrifying as being the father to his spirited daughter Alice. She was the one he was talking about when someone told him that he needed to control his daughter. Teddy replied, Sir, I can run the country or I can control Alice, but I cannot do both. Roosevelt had quite the reputation in his day. He'd made a name for himself out west, knocked heads with criminals and politicians in New York, led a bunch of cowboys, misfits, and polo pony riders during a series of crazed battles in Cuba, carved out the Panama Canal, and coined phrases like, speak softly and carry a big stick. America was at the top of its game, really coming into its own as a world power. Roosevelt was feared by people across the globe, but not by his oldest daughter Alice. Alice famously did whatever she wanted during her father's presidency. She said what she wanted, she smoked in public, she drank and didn't care what people thought. And you'd better believe that nobody could say or do anything to Alice without incurring the wrath of her father. She was unafraid of speaking her mind or voicing her opinion. At a time when women were usually considered to be practically a piece of furniture, and she frequently did these things when dignitaries were visiting the White House, and she usually did it just to make them angry. She also shared her father's love of firearms, and it's noted that she always carried a pistol with her when she went on long train journeys so that she could lean out the window and shoot at telephone poles when she was bored. And then there was the voodoo doll. Alice publicly announced that she had buried a voodoo doll in the White House garden at the end of her father's term so that she could cast a hex on the incoming Taft administration. And it worked. Taft only served one term and made the voodoo doll story famous. Woodrow Wilson heard the story and was so unnerved by it that he banned Alice from the White House. He went on to be elected to two terms, but he also died after having a stroke during his second term. Maybe there was a little bit of that hoodoo left in the garden after all. I was 10 years old, some 20-odd years ago, and going through what I look back on now as a pretty tough time, though it didn't occur to me then. 
it was just life. My parents had recently divorced, and I lived alone with my mam, northern colloquialism for mum. She had to take on extra work after my dad left, and I had recently been given my own key as I was due to start secondary school and she wouldn't be in when I came home. It was a hard time, with never enough money and so much change and turmoil. I was obviously more anxious about the whole situation than I thought at the time, as my experience starts with a dream. Despite the time that has passed, I remember everything about that night with such clarity like it was yesterday. I remember I was dreaming that I had lost my newly acquired door key at the deep end of the secondary school's swimming pool when I was awoken by someone sitting on my bed. I was laid on my side, facing the wall, and I had a cabin bed, which is a raised bed a few feet from the floor, which was accessed by a small ladder. I immediately tensed. My ma'am never sat on my bed when she tucked me in. She had to stand on her tiptoes to kiss me goodnight. She most certainly wasn't going to climb a ladder to sit with me, and I just knew it wasn't her. There was no one else in the house. We lived alone. I could feel the pressure in the small of my back as someone leaned against me and began to run their hands up and down my side on top of the covers, in a comforting way. The way you would when you smooth the covers when you tuck your child in and if you were soothing them off to sleep. It was in no way threatening. Despite that, I was frightened. I laid with my face to the wall and didn't dare move. I kept thinking, don't let them know you're awake, and I tried to regulate my breathing. After what I felt like was forever, but most likely was minutes, half an hour at most, I heard my ma'am get up and go to the bathroom. Still facing the wall and not moving, I shouted, ma'am, have you been in my room? She replied, no, why? And I asked her to come in. During this, I could still feel the pressure on my back and the weight on my bed, though the movement of hands had stopped. As soon as I asked her to come in, the pressure eased and disappeared. She came in and I told her what had happened. As I was explaining and I was showing her where the pressure was, we realized that despite it being a warm time of the year and the rest of the duvet being room temperature, that that spot on my body was icy, icy cold. My ma'am told me not to worry, that it was the living we should be scared of, not the dead. She had no idea who it could be, having not lost any close relatives recently, but we agreed that it meant no harm, only comfort. It never happened again, though I did always get a weird feeling in that room, and never felt wholly comfortable, and in the end, I moved into the spare room. My poor little ma'am was taken away from me a few years ago after a ridiculously short battle with a very aggressive cancer, and I miss her every day still. I wonder why she doesn't visit me, despite us both believing and me sharing that experience with her, but there are many things I don't understand about that kind of thing. A couple of things have happened since her death, but nothing conclusive. I'd love to speak to her just one more time, though. I'm not sure the mediums in my area are particularly reputable, and I don't want to risk a bad experience on something so important. I did toy with the idea that the ghost which visited me when I was 10 may have been me when I die in the future, or even my ma'am after she died. Surely time has no relevance when you're dead. And I, she, wanted to show me when I was younger that it would be okay in the end. I don't know. It now sounds crazy when I say it. When Weird Darkness Returns For most people, spotting a UFO would be considered extremely unusual, but for two Ohio women, seeing a UFO was the least surprising part of their experience. There have been monsters among us lurking in the darkest corners of America, preying on children since the first settlers arrived on our shores. They've always been with us, stalking the innocent from the days of the original colonies to the Gilded Age, 
the Depression, and beyond. These monsters are not the stuff of fiction. They are blood-curdlingly real, and they still walk among us, always looking for their next victim. In the chilling book Suffer the Children, Troy Taylor shines a light on the darkest tales of horror and hauntings from American history and presents a terrifying collection of dark crimes perpetrated against our most tender victims, our children. His most disturbing book yet includes nightmarish tales from the 19th century, when the good old days were never good, like The Monster of the North Wood, The Pocasset Horror, and The Girl in the Cellar, and continues into the modern day with accounts of The Cluxon Woods, America's first school massacre, Wineville chicken coop murders, Babes of Inglewood, Suzanne Degnan, The Girl Scout Camp Massacre, The Perfect Murder of Bobby Franks, and many more. Be warned, this is not a book for the faint of heart. These are tales containing brutal, agonizing, and terrifying scenes of horror. Suffer the Children, American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings, Dead Men Do Tell Tale Series Book 15 by Troy Taylor. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In June 2001, two sisters, Angie Whitmire and Deborah Simmons, were returning from a day of shopping in Dayton, Ohio, when a strange light in the sky caught their attention. We were heading home to Kingman, Ohio, on State Road 73, Deborah recalled. It was a beautiful evening, around 8.30 p.m., the air was warm and the sky crystal clear. Angie was driving and I was watching the scenery go by when I noticed a bright light in the western sky. Deborah watched in amazement as the light grew in intensity and flew toward the car at an incredible speed. Deborah asked me what that weird light was, said Angie, but we were close to Caesar Creek Lake and the road was pretty dark, so I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it. But then it flew right in front of us, so I couldn't miss it. The bright light soared past the car and hovered over the nearby treetops, casting an eerie glow over the entire area. Whitmire pulled the car over onto the side of the road so they could get a better look at the unusual object. Deborah was shocked by how large and close the UFO was to them. The light was so bright and white that you couldn't see any shape behind it, but we could tell it was pretty big, at least as big as a house. The funny thing was that I couldn't hear any sort of engine like you would normally hear with an airplane or a helicopter. It was completely silent. Suddenly, another identical bright light swooped down from the sky and hovered a short distance away. The two sisters decided the situation was becoming too strange and tried to drive away. That's when I discovered that the car had stopped and I couldn't restart it, Angie said. Nothing worked. The lights, the radio, it was completely dead. The two women also noticed an odd silence had descended over the area accompanied by a strange feeling of isolation. Angie remembered that it seemed as if they were the only people in the world. I don't remember seeing another car come by during the entire time we were there, which is really weird because at that time of an evening there's always traffic on that road, and it was just dead silent outside. No birds, nothing. It was as if we were in another world. Uncertain what to do next, Angie and her sister continued to watch the strange pair of lights when, unexpectedly, both objects shot straight up and disappeared into the night sky. The area was plunged into darkness, and, oddly enough, the normal sounds of the night came back almost as if switched on. As soon as the lights flew away, Deborah said, the car started running again all by itself. The lights and radio were on just as they were before everything happened. According to their watches, the strange encounter had lasted more than 20 minutes. However, when they arrived home, Deborah's husband seemed unconcerned about what they thought was a late arrival. That's when they discovered that instead of being after 9 p.m., as their wristwatches indicated, it was only 8.35 p.m. It was as if the entire time we spent looking at those lights had never happened 
Angie said. But it did happen. Our watches both showed we had been stuck out there for over 20 minutes, but somehow we gained that time back with a few minutes to spare. Normally, we should have been home at around 10 to 9, but somehow, despite what had happened, we got there early. One of the strangest aspects of some UFO encounters is the apparent distortion of time when a UFO is nearby. Researchers and writers have tried for years to understand and to interpret what happens before, during, and after a close encounter with a UFO. But many reports of time anomalies have been kept off some UFO databases because such events fall outside of the preconceived notions of what a UFO sighting should entail. Like the two Ohio sisters, others who have experienced a close contact with a UFO have reported apparent time distortions like the failure of car engines, a strange feeling of isolation to the point where it is observed that no other vehicles or people are seen during the sighting, unusual silence, spatial changes, altered states of consciousness, and distortions in the flow of time. Generally, these anomalies disappear along with the UFO. Occasionally, however, the witnesses will suffer from unexpected relapses, weeks, even years after the initial experience. These anomalous events have created more headaches than answers for researchers who have attempted to find scientific validation for unusual UFO encounters. On the surface, some of the reported anomalies seem to be explainable using modern science. However, upon closer analysis, strange things tend to become even stranger. The disruption of car motors, machinery, and electronic devices during a UFO event has been commonly reported. Thousands of these inexplicable stories have been duly recorded over the years, and many volumes have been written in an attempt to understand the underlying principles involved. Mark Rogier of the Center for UFO Studies analyzed 441 cases in which the car, truck, or other motor vehicle in which a witness was either riding or in near proximity to was seemingly affected by the presence of a UFO. Headlights, radios, and even flashlights were also affected. Of the vehicle failure cases summarized by Rajair, 10% noted an unusual phenomenon called spontaneous engine restarts at the end of a sighting. In reality, this figure is probably much higher considering the amount of underreported and underdocumented cases worldwide. In these cases, the car's engine would mysteriously restart without the driver turning the key. One witness said, as soon as the UFO flew away, the car, radio, headlights switched back on by themselves. One second everything was completely dead, and the next everything was running smoothly as if nothing had ever happened. The witness said he was left with the feeling that his car had been stopped between the ticks of a clock, like time had completely vanished. Another notable feature of many cases is the sudden unusual silence and an overwhelming feeling of isolation in the proximity of a UFO. Many people have noted that normal sounds – birds, insects, traffic – suddenly stop just before and during a close UFO sighting. A man from Wisconsin reported that he had observed a UFO hovering over the treetops directly over his head once while deer hunting. He stated that the day had been windy and the trees were swaying and creaking pretty loudly in the breeze. What made him look up was the fact that all of a sudden the forest went completely dead. He noted that the trees had stopped moving as if frozen in place. That is when he noticed a strange, dark, triangular-shaped object floating over the trees. It was a little bigger than a pickup truck and was solid black. I didn't see any lights or hear any kind of sound from it. The hunter reported feeling like he was looking up through a tunnel with me at the bottom and the UFO at the top. I knew that I was completely alone and that no one could help me. As soon as the UFO passed overhead, the forest returned to normal. The experience of such unusual sensations around a UFO has been dubbed the Oz Effect by UFO researcher and author Jenny Randles and may indicate that there could be a field of influence that's being emitted around a UFO. Anyone close enough to a UFO would find himself completely contained within this field. 
the odd effects noticed by eyewitnesses could give us some kind of indication of the true nature of these energy fields. Unfortunately, anecdotal accounts of UFO experiences have rarely been followed up with rigorous studies of their content. Scientists brave or foolhardy enough to try and conduct proper research on the nature of UFOs have been unable to find satisfactory answers as to why UFOs seem to cause time distortions. Past interpretations of Einstein's physics leave little room for localized time anomalies, unless influenced by a gravitationally massive object such as a black hole. However, the new kids on the physics block, quantum and string theories, may show that time and space are easier to influence than was previously thought. Some physicists believe that it is possible to engineer space-time itself and to surround a spaceship with a local space-time in such a way that, locally, the light barrier remains intact, while from the outside the ship is moving at faster-than-light velocity. UFOs that seem to rapidly accelerate, change direction, or even disappear are actually operating conservatively from the viewpoint of their own internal time rates. If someone or something came close enough to a ship that was creating its own space-time, normal time and space, as they know it, would cease to exist for them and they would come under the influence of the artificial space-time. This could explain some of the stranger aspects of UFO encounters, such as environmental sounds disappearing, isolation, the freezing of motors and electronic devices, and the feeling of time slowing down, stretching out, and losing all meaning. The UFO is literally creating an alteration in the local state of space-time, thus generating a major distortion effect that's experienced by the witnesses. Within this time anomaly, the perceived forward motion of time could even disappear, allowing for the past, present, and future to intrude upon one another. In 1981, Linda Taylor and her mother were traveling in Manchester, England. The normally busy road they were on became strangely empty, and the two women noticed a huge light in the sky that seemed to pace their car. Linda told investigators that her car jerked about and slowed down despite her attempts to accelerate. Suddenly, an old-fashioned car appeared in the road ahead and drove straight towards the two women. At the same time, the light in the sky turned into a metal disc that hovered over the main road. As the UFO moved away from Taylor and her mother, the old car vanished instantly. When the women returned home, they found that two hours were missing from their trip. As with some others who have had close UFO encounters, Linda later had several odd psychic experiences and further time lapses. Time distortions may not always occur with a visible UFO nearby. In 1980, Peter Rochkowitz, now a professor of humanities and folklore at New York's Juilliard School, was in the University of Pennsylvania's library reading a UFO book suggested by another professor. As he read, Rajkowitz noticed that someone was standing in front of him. Looking up, he saw a very gaunt, pale man about six feet tall, weighing around 140 pounds. The strange man wore a black suit, black shoes, a black string tie, and a bright white shirt. His suit was loose, and it looked as though he had slept in it for days. He sat down like he had dropped from the ceiling, all in one movement, and folded his hands on top of a stack of books in front of him, Rojkowicz said. The man asked Rojkowicz what he was doing. He said he was reading about flying saucers. Have you seen a flying saucer? the man asked. Rojkowicz said he hadn't. Do you believe in the reality of flying saucers? Rojkowicz said he didn't know much about them and wasn't sure he was very interested in the phenomena. The man screamed, "'Flying saucers are the most important fact of the century and you are not interested?' The man then stood up, again all in a single, awkward movement, put his hand on Rajkowitz's shoulder and said, "'Go well on your purpose.' With that, he left. Rajkowitz was suddenly overwhelmed by fear. I had a sense that this man was out of the ordinary and that idea frightened me. I got up and walked around the stacks toward where the reference librarians usually are. The librarians weren't there. There were no guards there. There was nobody else in the library. I was utterly alone and terrified. 
The professor went back to the table where he'd been reading. To get myself together, he said. It took me about an hour. Then I got up and everything was back to normal. The people were all there. It would seem that Rajkowitz could have been placed in a separate time-space field in order for his contact to occur. The entire episode may have occurred in the blink of an eye in normal time-space, but for Rajkowitz, an entire hour had passed. One gentleman who reported his alleged UFO abduction on an internet forum said that when he was being returned from an abduction to the motel room where he was staying, he noticed that there was a person in the parking lot below us. Myself and several greys were floating in mid-air, so I had a bird's-eye view of the surroundings, who seemed to be frozen in mid-step. Everything was dead quiet and nothing was moving. It was as if time had stopped or frozen for the few moments it took for them to transport me from a UFO back to my room that was located on the second floor of the motel. These interesting cases show that there is still a lot we have to learn from UFO reports. Investigators need to be willing to look beyond the traditional by-the-book questions and allow the witnesses to relate their entire experience, no matter how unusual it may be. Many researchers and databases fail to mention some of the stranger aspects of UFO encounters because they don't fit a particular belief system or bias. We can learn much more if researchers put aside their own personal feelings and allow the full information to come forward. Currently, any theories and conclusions are really little more than speculation. Nevertheless, scientists who are not afraid to look beyond the norm are every day developing new concepts in physics and the true nature of reality. Keep listening, I have several tales still to come when Weird Darkness returns. Do you keep a journal or diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. I was never what you would call normal. My name is Dylan, and from the time I was born, I had unmatched strength. My father said he discovered it for the first time when I was three years old. We were wrestling in the living room, and I threw him through the drywall. He broke his wrist and had a few marks on him, but he recovered just fine. My parents were always supportive and encouraged me to harness my abilities. I was homeschooled and was never allowed to participate in sports or social events. From an early age, they had a strange curriculum for me. I would learn anger management above any other subject and then practice controlling my strength. Sometimes I'd get frustrated, but it was never really a big deal. I understood there was a reason I couldn't play sports or interact with other kids my age. Eventually, I turned 18 and was considered a higher education. My parents understood my wants, though they tried their best to talk me out of it. I explained that I was done being kept behind walls and I wanted to explore the world. I wish I hadn't. Before I enrolled in college, I decided to take a trip. I didn't go anywhere too huge, just right outside my hometown, to explore the world. 
Huh, it was lovely. The sunsets, the warm sand under my feet as I walked through the beaches, conversations with people who were not my parents or their friends, all of it was just so nice. What I didn't know about, however, were bullies. Well, I knew of them. My father had lesson plans dedicated to them and how I could and should defend people from them, while assuring not to deal any physical harm unless somebody's life was in immediate danger. Well, one day I was at the mall and had just finished watching a movie at the theater. I was sitting on a small bench just a few feet from the entrance. A few women were walking by and I made eye contact with one of them and we smiled at each other. As they passed, a large group of men were coming from the other direction. They were very enthusiastic, to say the least, and all began shouting catcalls. I rolled my eyes and continued listening to their corny pickup lines. I was curious how people interacted and wanted to observe everything I could before I moved across the state. It was clear that the women were not interested and tried to make their way past the men and into the theater. And that's when things took a bad turn. The group would not let them pass and were becoming more aggressive with their pickup lines and attempts to wow them. I heard one woman say in an annoyed tone, Okay, stop, we just want to go see our movie. I chuckled and felt for the men. One of my father's lessons was that sometimes in life you will simply get rejected. Whether it's by a woman who's not into you, a rejected promotion or job application, a teacher giving you a grade below what you think it's worth. Whomever it may be, sometimes things just won't go your way in life, and that's okay. It's up to you to control where your day is going to go from here. I thought that would be a lesson that everybody was taught, an obvious moral compass. <sighs> I was wrong. I saw one of the men grab one of the women by her wrist and start to get angry. She yelled for the man to stop, but he insisted that she listen to him. I walked over and attempted to break up the little scene that had been created. He let go of her wrist and spun to face me. He was so incredibly angry and unhinged, I had no clue why. Was it his pride? Was he embarrassed that the women weren't into him or his friends? I had a problem processing the situation because it seemed to be of such little importance. I apologized if I'd upset him, then explained that him and his friends should just go, because these women were clearly going to be late for their movie. He licked his lips and rolled his shoulders in a manner that suggested he was angry enough to become physical with me. Again, I had no clue why, but his friends seemed to know something I didn't, because they shouted and encouraged the entire situation. I shrugged and turned to the women gesturing to the door and explaining that they should just go see their movie. I turned around to try and defuse the situation, but the man was already bouncing around and holding his hands in front of him as if he thought I was going to try and fight him. All of his friends were holding cell phones and screaming for the man to, and I quote, beat my ass. I turned over to the women to encourage them to go inside once more, and to my surprise, a majority of them were also recording the situation on their phones. How did that happen? I went from trying to defuse a situation to becoming the center focus of a fight that I wanted no part of. I wasn't going to go against my parents' lifelong teachings the first time I went out in the world, so well, I did what I think everybody should do in a situation where violence is simply not needed. I turned and began walking away. I heard his feet scratch the floor and his footsteps patter towards me. I spun around and saw him running at me with his fist held back ready for a punch. Now, my reflexes have always been a tad bit above the average human, so I watched him come at me and thought about my best move. A full sprint to me when I apply my full training looks like a fast-paced walk. When he finally reached me, I placed my hands in my pockets and closed my eyes. And to this man's credit, he must have been an athlete because I vaguely felt his knuckles make contact with my jaw. I heard the people screaming and cheering, and I looked at the man who had punched me. I felt an instant regret when I saw him holding his hand. 
He kept his composure and continued to insult me, but anyone who was there would be able to see that his wrist was now clearly broken. Why? Why didn't he just walk away? Was this really the world I was kept from? Angry and bitter people who turned to violence and insults over the littlest of things? I wish I could say that the whole thing ended there, but that'd be something I could handle. After the man had punched me, he stumbled back and pulled a gun from his waistband. At this time, the group of girls began screaming and sprinted inside the movie theater. His friends screamed at him to put the gun away, but I didn't think they cared either way because they kept their phones in their hands. I looked him in the eye and pleaded with him, saying, "'Please, put the gun away. I don't want anyone to get hurt, and I don't want to hurt you.'" I had no clue that everything people say sounds like a challenge to the outside world. I saw red and blue lights up the walls around us, and before I knew it, the entire place was covered with police cars. The man's friends ran as soon as they saw the cops approach, but he stayed right where he was, staring at me with malice and holding the barrel of his gun centered with my head. A few officers stepped out of their cars and pulled their weapons out, aiming at the man and demanding that he drop his weapon and get down on his knees. What have I done? I didn't want any of this to happen. My father always told me that no matter what happens or who is around, not to judge or make harsh decisions. People are mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, friends. All I could think at the moment was no matter how this ended, the man in front of me was losing a part of his life. If he pulled the trigger, I would be perfectly fine, but the officers around us would fire at him and he'd lose his life. If, on the other hand, he surrendered, he would be going to prison for many years, and if he did have a wife or a son, they'd lose a husband and a father regardless of how this night ended. What have you done? I asked him this with remorse. He didn't say a word, he just stood there thinking about his next move. And that's when I saw it. He was squeezing the trigger. My adrenaline shot up and everything moved in slow motion. I saw smoke and fire explode from the barrel of his gun, and as the bullet left it, I turned to study the police officers. They were also squeezing the triggers of their weapons. I turned back to the man and sprinted towards him. As I made it over to him, I grabbed the bullet from the air and tried to kick him out of the oncoming fire from the officers. When I finally calmed down, I turned to see all the officers staring at me with dropped jaws. I felt a cold rush come over me and I turned to see if the man was okay. He was over 50 yards away, on the other side of the plaza. I ran over to him and picked him up. I began to cry and screamed for the officers to call an ambulance. I refused to give a statement and the officers didn't seem to mind. They figured no one would believe the situation anyway. They were all happy that no one was killed and considered the night to be a success. I disagree. The man lived, but he would be paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life with little motion in his arms. He would be unable to make love, play sports with his children, or even basic tasks without added difficulty. I felt awful, like everything I was taught was just thrown away. I moved down south and now I work for a small warehouse. I make a decent living since I have no social life and I'm able to pick up extra shifts without breaking any kind of sweat. I still sit awake at night and think back to the moment when I kicked the man. The scariest thing for me is, for a moment, I liked the sound of his ribs breaking on my foot. It's the only thing that keeps me going. Every morning I wake up and get on with my cataloging. When I'm finished, I'll be well again. It's akin to a jigsaw. When it's done, I'll be able to see the big picture. More importantly, I'll be able to leave. Long-term hospitalization is a drag. People can become institutionalized. I've seen it happen, both from a medic's perspective and that of a patient. Patience is definitely a virtue for patients. 
you lose track of the hours, the days, lose their names. If you find yourself looking forward to mealtimes in the hospital, you're halfway to giving in. I refuse to allow the television to intrude. Keeping your mind active is vital. Long-term patients divide into two camps once they understand their condition. I would always tell my parents their mindset from that point onward was crucial. Vegetate in front of a screen all day, you may never get out of bed at all. Keep your mind stimulated and as soon as you're able to, get up, push yourself. Of course it'll hurt. Healing is a painful process. The will to survive is all. Us medical staff can only do so much, then we have to stand back and let you take over. The amount of times I have given that little speech to my patients, and now I'm having to live my own words. I don't remember the accident. The brain protects you from trauma. I woke up a shattered man. I was not expected to live, but the will to survive surmounts the surgeon's prognosis. My own appraisal of the situation was naturally more accurate. Given time, I would get out of there. To begin with, I was the most patient patient. Compliant and accepting, tolerant of the machines and the procedures. The medication stilled my body but freed my mind from the pain. I could work on my plan while I was physically constrained, refining it into the goal, the metaphor for my healing process. As soon as I was able, I had them bring me my Gray's Anatomy. I knew my memory had been affected. I needed to be able to see the picture to do the jigsaw. I had never seen the point of jigsaws before then. Now I was putting together the pieces I needed to complete my own. As soon as I could physically remove myself from my bed, I did. Once the drips were out of my arms, the feeding tube from my throat, the catheter, they said it was a miracle, I knew it was not. This was stage two of the healing process, physical preparation. At first, I could do no more than shuffle across my room. The bolts of pain that shot through my spine, my limbs, every inch of me, I adjusted my medication accordingly. I knew it would get easier. Because of my own medical expertise, they gave me leeway with the management of my condition. I've seen most of the staff around here in my lectures over the years. Soon I was able to expand my horizons. I navigated the corridors slowly at first. I knew the place like the back of my hand. Better, in fact, as the accident had left no part of me unscathed. The staff would glance at me initially, then grew accustomed to my ever-presence and began nodding and wishing me a good morning, doctor. Old habits, I suppose. I wanted them to be accustomed to my presence so I could hide in plain sight. The acquisition of instruments was easy enough, too. I knew the passcodes to areas of the hospital that were off-limits to patients, and gaining access to operating theaters was not difficult. I was almost fully equipped to begin stage three of the proceedings, gathering the pieces of the jigsaw. I began in the morgue. The duty staff barely noticed as I paid a couple of routine visits to scope out the availability of suitable parts. Accident victims were the easiest to harvest from once the post-mortem was done. I had to make it a rule that I couldn't take more than one piece from each donor for fear of discovery. There was a freezer in the boiler room. That had always struck me as being anachronistic, but now wasn't the time for such idle thoughts. I cataloged each piece as it went into my collection. Every morning when I woke up, I reviewed my checklist and set myself the day's targets. Thorough and methodical, I worked my way down, ticking off each item as I went. I was nearly ready for the final stage that of assembly. The bed I had occupied for the duration of my stay had a large drawer underneath for patients' belongings. Mine was empty. The morning before the assembly was arduous. I had to make numerous trips to the basement, but eventually all the pieces were in the drawer. I rested on my bed for the whole afternoon, running through the procedures in my mind. It was going to be a long night. Various staff members came in periodically. To all appearances, I was asleep, and they did no more than check my vital signs. 
I knew that by the time the last rounds had been completed, my jigsaw would be thawed enough to be assembled. It took me from after my last check that night until the pallid fingers of dawn wiped themselves across the sky. I had swabbed and stitched, meticulously constructing the symbol, no, personification of my own recovery. The jigsaw was complete. I had done it. And I was exhausted. I rolled the body loosely in a sheet and slid it under the bed. Then I climbed onto the bed and slept the sleep of the dead. I woke suddenly to the noise of an alarm, a shrill, frantic beeping closely followed by footsteps and voices, muted but urgent. I pulled the sheet from over my face and was momentarily confused. The ceiling was very low and I could see legs and feet. The voices were becoming less muted and more urgent. The strident tone of the alarm persisted. Of course, I was under the bed. It had worked. Stand clear, someone shouted, and there was a bang and the ceiling above me shook. I eased myself carefully out from my confines. The medical staff were crowded around the body on the bed. They would not have noticed me if I had cartwheeled across the floor. Quietly, I slipped out through the door and went on my way. Six months ago, I started a new job. It required me to travel all over the UK in a van. I loved it. About four or five weeks ago, something happened, something I can't explain. I had a delivery to a place called Montrose in Scotland. It was approximately a 10-hour drive there and back. Everything was fine until the way back. A mix between a long day and the pitch-black night. I felt my eyes dropping so sensibly I pulled over and had a nap. It's quite cozy in the cab. Curtains shut, roll-out foam mattress, and an iPad with Netflix. I'd stopped in a secluded lay-by on a stretch of road called the A1 in between Burnmouth and Berwick-on-Tweed. I'd say I was asleep about three hours when I heard something outside. This isn't unusual in a lay-by, other road users and pesky chancers looking for trucks to rob. It sounded like nothing, so I shut my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a growl. I thought I must be going mad or just homesick, missing my dog who'd be asleep by the front door wondering why I haven't come home. I heard it again. But not just a growl, something rocked my van. This was not a drunken man falling into the side of it. This was a fierce and strong rock of my van. It shocked me so much I didn't know what to do. I laid there with a feeling of something is seriously wrong here. I didn't dare move in case my sleeping bag made any sort of noise and attracted an imaginary monster right to me. Realizing I was being stupid, I sat up, slowly peeked out the curtain to see if I could see anyone or anything around the van. Nothing. I was confused, but due to the cold, the dark, and the fact I was slightly scared, I had no intention of opening that door and checking. Laying there again, I had an urge to check if whatever I couldn't see was definitely gone. This time I peeked out of the opposite window curtain. I was looking for a couple of seconds when a car heading towards me on the main road lit up the laby, and I see it. It was huge, at least seven feet tall, taller than my van. It looked as if it was walking away. It hadn't found anything interesting. The car, however, changed that. It spun back around faster than anything I've ever seen. Instantly, I was mesmerized by a pair of big, angry, empty red eyes. It was probably seconds but felt like forever. I felt like I was in a trance. Just as quick as it started, it was over. I saw the thing charging as fast as a high-speed train towards the car. I took that as my opportunity to turn the engine on and bail, to drive and stop until I pulled up at my house. The drive home was nervy, scary and confusing, but within the three hours it took me to get home, I had somehow convinced myself that it was just a dream. It was my imagination. 
Those scary story podcasts and dark roads had played a trick on me. Nothing unusual had happened and everything was normal in my day-to-day -day life. My dreams, however, were a different story. Every time I'd drift off, the same thing would happen. I would be stood with my eyes closed. I'd open them to be in the middle of a pitch-black nowhere, staring into those same red eyes. I couldn't see anything else but those eyes. I wasn't scared or anything, so I'd continue staring. Eventually, I'd start to see reflections in those eyes, right where I should be standing. Instead, I could see everything it could see. I could see the thing walking and flexing two sets of wolverine-like claws. I'd watch as the thing stalked unsuspecting vulnerable prey, cows, sheep, humans. Like a poorly edited PowerPoint slideshow, I was suddenly in a laby. I could see my van. I could see myself peering out through a little gap in the curtains. That's when the penny dropped and I realized that this thing had seen me. It knew I was there. Fast forward on and I can see a man covered in blood, laying face down on the ground, a crumpled up car to the side of him. Slowly this thing's left claws reach down and grab the man's head, lifts it slightly, then brings its other claw around to his throat and rips it clean out. That's when I wake up. Panicking, sweating, and out of breath, I'm back in my room. The dog gives me a confused look and a loud sigh. He comforts me as I know I'm now back in reality and truly awake. It slowly started to progress and details started to change. It starts the same, still in the dark, still open my eyes and stare into those red eyes. Now, though, I see places that I recognize, people that I recognize. I saw a couple having a late-night walk along the seafront as the thing is crouched behind a large wall. I see it jump out and with one fast, powerful swing, two lifeless bodies lay there, still and as silent as the night. Again, it reaches down, grabs the man by his head and rips out his throat. That's when I wake up. Panicking, sweating, and out of breath, I am back in my room. Last night. Last night's the reason I'm writing this. Last night scared me more than any horror movie or weird darkness episode ever could. I stood with my eyes closed. I opened them. Nothing. Pitch black nothing. Caught me off guard and shook me a little. I was confused and didn't know if I was asleep yet or not. I blinked and suddenly I was in a garden. Nothing special, just a regular back garden adjoined to a small but new house. For no specific reason, I walked toward the French doors and peered in. I thought I recognized a few things, so assumed these dreams were now including things more personal to me. I reach out to try the handle and look down as I do. My hand wasn't there. Instead, was a grotesque, hairy, long-fingered hand with claws as sharp as steak knives that stopped at a point. Shocked, I stumbled backwards a little bit. I looked up. In the reflection, I could see myself, but it wasn't me. It wasn't my body. It was something else, something horrific and frightening. Just as I did that, I saw a beautiful face peer out of the glass. This girl looked straight at me, visibly frightened. She froze. I was stunned, though. A little curious feeling of familiarity emerged. She was about five feet, five inches, and thin, her long brown hair resting behind her ears. It was like time stopped. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Her unbelievably smoothed, tanned legs, leading up to her perfect torso, and then up to her neck. Her neck. Her neck. I started to feel like this desire, this anger. It was literally running through me, right down to my toes. The feeling was so strong, I felt like I was losing control. I had no idea what was happening. The only way I can describe it is this is how I imagine the Hulk feels. I could hear liquid dripping onto the floor, but it wasn't raining. It was the saliva leaking from in between a set of enormous, snarling fangs. 
and then I noticed the smell. I'd never noticed it before, but the odor of human flesh was so alluring. My nose started to twitch uncontrollably. My body lurched forward, completely annihilating the doors. She had barely moved an inch by the time I was directly in front of her. She looked up at me with those big, round, watery eyes. I felt like I recognized them, but the feeling was too intense. It was driving me crazy. Then the pain started, a sharp stabbing in my abdomen. Unfortunately, it wasn't her rescuer, but I finally understood what was going on. I was hungry. Starving, in fact. She screamed, what are you? As I lifted my right arm, she begged, no, please. I watched my arm swipe in slow motion, milliseconds before contact. I wake up. Panicking, sweating, and out of breath, I'm back in my room. I let out a sigh of relief, thankful that intense dream was over. Yawning, I shout, and my dog, surprisingly, is not by my side. I've usually got a 40-kilogram lap dog to contest my pillow with. I pull back the sheets to go check where he is, and I'm embraced with a plethora of blood. It's everywhere, thick, dry clots of it, mixed with long brown hair stuck to my legs. I stumbled out of bed and down the hall following the erratic blood splatters and handprints. I kept following them, down the stairs and into the dining room, where an unexplainable gaping hole in the back of the house bewildered me. It looked as if a car had crashed directly through what should be my French doors. I moved forward to take a closer look, and something catches my eye. To the right of me, a body, a disfigured, unrecognizable body. I screamed, cried, and panicked. I dropped to my knees, and in front of me lay a love, heart-shaped necklace, similar to the one I had gotten my girlfriend for her birthday a few months prior. He was even personalized, with the exact quote, to the moon and back. Keep listening, there's more weird darkness to come. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. I'm writing this as some sort of vain attempt towards a personal closure. I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen to me, but considering the current state of events, I'm almost positive that I don't have much time to get away. I'm sure that I'm not in any immediate danger, but instead of procrastinating the documentation of my story even further, I decided I should do so before I can't. So here I am, typing out the occurrences, hoping to just get my story out in the open. Maybe this will make me feel better. Maybe it'll give me the courage to do something about it. To get away. Regardless, I feel the need to try to give myself that last push and at the same time warn others, if possible, about how the unknown is always there, watching, waiting, hoping that you'll notice it. It started when we moved into our current house around five years ago. We're renting, so theoretically we could get out at any time, but my mother doesn't really believe me about what's happening and my stepfather couldn't care less. A lot of the occurrences seem to be random, completely unrelated to each other, and many of them have been of different behaviors than the usual ones. I've always been one to believe in the paranormal, even if only slightly, so I wasn't really shaken once the house started to give off an eerie feeling. 
When that feeling started growing, however, I could also sense a presence. This presence wasn't keen to being ignored, and it definitely did not like staying put in one place. I'm going to try my best to describe the bigger events in chronological order, though my memory is especially hazy lately from severe lack of sleep, so they may not be perfect. From the beginning, I didn't like the house. At first, I thought I'd be fine. When school came around, though, I wasn't. My mother was working as a teacher at the nearby university, and her husband also taught at one, though it was almost in another county altogether. Given the convenience of just staying in her office on campus for my mom and my stepfather having such a long commute that he spent most of the day out there, I was constantly alone in the house. The first thing that bothered me was that my stuff would always go missing. Yeah, a lapse of memory, it happens to everyone, I understand. This was different, though. It would wait until I looked everywhere, turned my room and anywhere else in the missing object could have been upside down, and I was reduced to tears. Then, out of nowhere, it would be right in the middle of the floor directly in front of me. Whenever it would take my phone, it would hide it inside a box or behind things that it would have no business being behind and still be on ring. As I would call it from the house phone, though, it would not ring, no sound whatsoever. Even if I were directly next to or on top of where I would later find it, it's as if it was placed into an entirely different dimension for a while. This sort of thing still happens, and it always waits until immediately after I'm reduced to tears to finally reveal where it has been all along. After it realized it could get a reaction out of me from stealing my belongings, it got desperate for attention. At least, that's what I suppose has been going on, since its actions remind me of a mischievous kid who loves to play pranks and gets extremely annoyed once ignored. At the time, I wasn't really sure what to do, so I did start ignoring it. Soon, it would bother me constantly when I was home alone or with friends. If I was sitting on the couch watching TV, it would be in the wall behind me, scratching at the insides of the paneling in long, deliberate strokes. When that would happen, I would silently move over on the couch, though that never did anything to deter it. It would stop momentarily, then begin again behind my new seated position. Doors would slam constantly. Most commonly, the upstairs bathroom door, which would also open suddenly if I were inside taking a shower or using the toilet. Every time before it would open, I would hear scratching on the door and assume it was my cat trying to open it. That was rarely the case, though. Never wanting to be by myself, after it had opened the door, I'd call my cat's name and she'd come bounding over to me from wherever she was in the house, meowing in confusion. One night, out of the blue, I heard a scratching noise in the corner of my room. Well, scratching isn't the best description. More accurately, it closely resembled the noise of a match furiously scraping against a matchbook in a vain attempt to get it lit. Out of curiosity, I headed toward the noise and saw the bottom corner of one of my walls in my room burning away without any visible flame. The noise went on even as I got closer and the wood continued to singe. I was tired and frankly quite fed up, so I just grabbed the squirt bottle I had in case my cat tried to break my things as I slept and doused the rapidly burning corner of the room with water. As strange as this must sound, it seemed to fizzle out, and the scraping noise stopped. I went back to bed, though I did get little to no sleep and took a picture of it in the morning. A few years later, I realized that for whatever reason, it tried to burn my room down. I stopped ignoring it after that event, even though at the time I still wasn't particularly scared more annoyed than anything. One night I had a friend over for a sleepover, which was a rare occasion simply because of how bizarre my house is. We were set up in the office downstairs, since my bedroom was too cluttered. Once it got to be about 1 a.m. is when the activity started. My more social cat was in the room with us, 
and she began acting panicky. The door was closed and she kept asking to go outside into the dining room, then would come back in. Because of what happened next, however, we would not let her out anymore. We heard the furniture begin shifting. We couldn't see it, of course, but we could clearly hear the dining room furniture being moved across the carpet. That went on for a while until we felt like there was something standing directly outside of the office door and immediately afterwards heard something step in front of it. We didn't dare move or even breathe. The presence disappeared after a while, but we still didn't try opening the door. Later that morning, my alarm clock started going off, first with beeps very far apart from each other in time, then occurring more rapidly. It sounded as though it were a ticking time bomb. It had never acted that way before, but after that night, it would do it constantly, even when unplugged and turned off. At around 10 a.m. in the morning of that sleepover, sirens could be heard rushing toward my neighborhood. A house, about six doors down, had caught fire suddenly. I still think this is a coincidence, though it is worth mentioning. Soon after, for a brief while, it would break my belongings instead of hiding them. If I let something out of my sight, even for a moment, I'd hear some loud snap and it would be done for. The noise of my cats was no longer the only one knocking over various things in my room as I slept, or at least attempted to sleep, while quickly getting increasingly frustrated. When both cats were in my room for the night, they would often walk towards a corner of the room, different from the burnt one but parallel to it, as though in a trance, and sit and stare at it for hours without moving. I wanted it to leave my cats and I alone, but no one but my friends who had also experienced the weird phenomena while with me would believe me that there was something off in the house. So, I stupidly figured that maybe instead of fully ignoring it, I could maybe say hi once in a while, or tell it to knock it off. The idea came to me one night as my bed was shaking, something that became a common occurrence about two years after the move. When I would tell my mom, she'd always shrug it off, saying it was probably because of the nearby train. The passing train would shake the house slightly when it would pass by around 1 a.m. each night. The bed issue, though, was always around 10 p.m., 3 a.m., or 4 a.m., and felt very deliberate. It would always start up gradually, then suddenly increase to the point where the bed was just rocking from side to side and last a period of time ranging from a couple of minutes to around 20 minutes. As I was getting to, one time I was particularly annoyed since I was enjoying the book I was reading when this started up again, so I just simply said, stop shaking the bed, and it stopped. I was really confused for a minute since I didn't think it would actually do anything. The times afterwards, however, speaking up did nothing. Anyhow, it did stop doing it as often after that point. When it did, I was less freaked out by it than before. I never would get out of bed as it happened in fear that maybe something under the bed was shaking it, but I would have my phone with me, so I felt secure. Once I even took a chance, since she's a heavy sleeper, and texted my mother about it when it was going on at around 4 a.m. as usual, and the text woke up my stepfather, who in turn woke her. She came into my room a few minutes later and it was still shaking. That's the only inexplicable thing that has been brought to my attention that she actually believes me on, though she still doesn't care about it much. One time, about a year ago, I decided to sleep in my bubble chair for a couple of weeks because there was an earwig in my bed, and I'm deathly afraid of them. When I was in the chair, it shook violently almost every night. Maybe I was easier to reach when in the chair, who knows. It may just be that it takes less energy to rock a chair around than shift a bed. The most disturbing incident that occurred was around three years ago. I was home alone sometime in November, and my mother wasn't going to be home until around 10. I was just chatting with some friends on Facebook when I realized I had laundry to do because who cares about homework, but having clothes readily available is a must. 
so I went up to my room to sort my dirty clothes and choose which pile to throw in the washer down in the basement. As soon as I got into my room and faced my closet, I heard a door behind me slam. It wasn't my bedroom door, it was either the upstairs bathroom door or the door to my mother's room, but I didn't particularly care to find out. Both of the cats who were curled up together on my bed woke up and were on high alert, looking at me as though they blamed me for the noise. I ran downstairs without looking to see which door had slammed shut and went back down to the computer to whine to my friends through Facebook about my creepy house. It was all I could do to keep calm since I had nowhere I could go nearby, and I wasn't about to leave my cats alone with this thing and I know that both my older sister and my mother would not be picking up their phones if I called. A few minutes later, I had calmed down again, but then the footsteps started. They weren't gentle at all, they were loud and booming as though someone directly above me were stomping around in a huff. In their wake, doors were slamming once more, causing the cats to both run downstairs in fear and look at me as if pleading that I'd do something to shut it up. Even though I had no use for it, I grabbed a large butcher's knife and sat back down at the computer with my phone in hand. I was entirely defenseless if it had decided to hurt me. The footsteps neared the top of the stairs, and then they stopped. Just as I was about to breathe out a sigh of relief, the whistling started. I can't really remember the whistling tune, though it would be something I'd be able to recognize immediately if I heard it again. When I saw Insidious after it came out, I thought it was a lame movie, but it stuck with me on a traumatic level because of the scene where the father's in the house of the family uh, of beings in which the father is whistling while reading the morning paper. The tune was so similar and the circumstances so haunting that I almost cried while watching it. Once it started, my first thought was to look out the windows nearby because it could have been somebody out on a late stroll around the neighborhood. We live practically right downtown where we are, and it's definitely a busy place, even on November evenings. After a few moments, it became evident that it was coming from inside the house. It was extremely audible, an extraordinarily clear noise to the point of almost ringing in my ears while also sounding somewhat wispy, as though if the sound itself were touched it would dissipate like fog. It began quietly then increased in volume as it headed down the stairs. I frantically began dialing my mother on my phone and grabbed the knife backing towards the kitchen. She didn't pick up. I quickly started calling my sister and the same result. I was lucky that it moved really slowly, I suppose. I called my mother once more. No answer again. It was downstairs at that point, and the sound was floating towards me. As it was getting louder and louder, I felt my skin was crawling and my ears being invaded by this eerily cheerful, malicious tune. I began dialing my sister again, and at this point I was shaking violently, not knowing what I would do if it got any closer. I couldn't see anything besides the normal surroundings, so I could only vaguely tell where it was by the echoing, unbreaking whistling that seemed to be all around me now. Just as I could feel it right in front of me, practically on top of me and inside my head, my sister finally answered. Hello? Elizabeth? As soon as I yelled my sister's name, it stopped. It faded, like a door shut and locked away the sound, muffling it until it gradually vanished. Even though it was gone, I didn't feel any less uneasy and had no idea what to tell my sister. I eventually spouted something rushed like, I feel like there's someone in the house and I just heard them and the cats are upset, but there's no one here. I just need someone with me. Her response effectively consisted of, you're crazy and mom will be home soon, chill out, before she hung up on me. I was alone again and my friends online on Facebook were slightly worried since I had suddenly said something akin to, it's here, in the group chat, then stopped replying. My mother called back a little later, and I told her I just needed her to come home right away. Once she got back, the sight of someone else made me finally burst into tears. Before I fully explained what happened in between sobs, she stood in the doorway, 
staring up the stairs for a good half hour or so before she shook her head and sat down on a couch in the living room. After that, not much happened for a long time, maybe a year or two, it seems. The activities only really started up again about a year ago, so that must be right. Occasionally, I'd hear the whistling faintly through the vents and go into a brief state of shock or the classic slamming doors episodes would happen when I snuck my then-girlfriend into the house in the middle of the day. Other than that, it didn't bother with me for a while. When it did, everything started up again at once with some new additions to the routine. It started not only peeking in on me in the bathroom but my mother too. I had to cover my window because I'm always sleeping in during the day and the light wakes me up and ever since it's been covered by a sheet, night and day there's a loud scratching on the outside of my window almost every night. There are no trees within 15 feet of my window or anything else that could scratch it, so I knew what was going on immediately. The walls of my room would reverberate on occasion, as though something was stuck inside them and rattling around at high speed while also crawling towards the direction of my door. That happened several nights for a while in different spots each time, strong enough to make my entire room shake. And now, when things go missing, they disappear straight from my hand and will be gone for days. It's also begun knocking things over on top of me, at which I have expressed my disdain. I don't think it particularly cares how I feel, which I guess should be obvious by now. I think it really is trying to communicate with me but just doesn't know how, as though it's approaching all of these different methods to try and get me to react without knowing how to really go about it itself. Either way, it is not a friendly presence and its actions really have been getting worse over time. I've become pretty numb to the happenings but it's going through a calm phase again. A little while ago, everything stopped and soon after it started acting up again so obviously that even my mother is now a little concerned at this point. The attic door, which is in the wall behind my bed, has always worried me, so my six-foot bookcase is right in front of it. But a couple of weeks ago, I swear, I heard something try to open the door against the bookcase. I'm seeing shadows out of the corners of my eyes. I'm constantly feeling like I'm being pushed into places. My dreams are becoming more and more frantic, my nightmares more and more disturbing, and even my lucid dreams at this point are spiraling out of control. I can no longer sleep, and I feel it outside my room on the nights I wake up and my door is wide open. I know it's watching me. And a week ago, I heard it beside my bed. I was sleeping on my side, facing the wall, when I heard panting and heavy breathing behind me which woke me up, but it stopped when I actually opened my eyes. I had felt its presence, and once I had gained enough courage to flip over, all evidence of it being there was gone and my door still closed. It's clear to me that it does have plans for me. As for what, I'm not sure. Whatever they are, I have a large feeling that it'll act on them soon, which led me to try and get my story out before that happens. Perhaps I'm not the only one going through situations like this, so I'd like to offer some advice. Don't speak to it. I let it into my thought process by telling it how I felt. Now it invades my personal space, watches me as I sleep, and has been dramatically worsening my insomnia. Even with both cats on me, I'm too scared to sleep when I hear it outside my room. Even though its pranks and annoyances will seemingly get worse if you do, ignore it. Pay no attention to it. As long as you do that, it won't do anything to touch you. It won't leave the walls, the floors, whatever it's usually confined in. Don't give it hope. As I've been typing this, the computer has been acting up. The headphones were in, but the sound started blasting from the speakers. The window next to me, had been rattling for a while. I could feel someone standing behind me for close to half an hour as I typed this. I finally let out my story, almost in its entirety, and it is mad now. The house has been shaking. I don't think it'll get me now, but it is waiting, waiting for me to become so worn out from paranoia that my guard will be down completely. Then, I suppose, it will do whatever it is that it's been wanting to. 
I've kind of accepted it at this point, though I'm not very happy about it. I just want to make sure that no one else ends up in this position. Please, for my sake and yours, don't let this be you. A lot more weird darkness is yet to come, so keep listening. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The smell of chocolate chip cookies, fresh from the oven, brushed my face as I stepped into my grandma's house. This was always something that I could count on when I would go to my grandma's. I was always greeted with a warm smile, a hug, and usually a cookie of some variety. Her house had always been a safe haven for me, but she always would warn me to not go into the left side of the basement. She'd always told me that it was some old butcher's tools from when grandpa was alive and she didn't want me getting hurt so she said it was for the best that I just steer clear of that room. She'd asked me to come over that day and help her to move a new chest freezer into the basement. This seemed slightly strange to me since I knew she already had a freezer in the basement, but I just figured she needed more freezer space with the holidays coming soon, and she was always a world-class cook in my book. My cousin had met me at the back door. He was over to help me get this rather large freezer into the basement. All right, do you want to go down the stairs or do you want me to be on that end? He asked me. I'll take the top end, I responded. After about ten minutes of this struggle, we finally have the freezer at the bottom of the steps, but I forgot to ask where Grandma wanted us to put this monster. Just bring it into the left side and I can get it from there, thanks boys, she yelled down the stairs at us. So we did as told and brought it into the left side of the basement. I felt around the wall for a light switch, finally located it and flipped it on. To my surprise, the basement was not flooded with light as I'd expected. Hmm. The bulb must have burned out. We'll just get the freezer in here and let Grandma know so she can replace it, I said to my cousin. Now let's get out of here. It smells kind of funky down here. Back upstairs, Grandma gave us both a cookie and thanked us for the help of getting it downstairs. I let her know about the light being out in the basement. She thanked me and said that she would take care of that herself. My cousin and I left her house and waved my cousin goodbye and started the short walk home to my house. While the walk was short, it was not a fun walk. Winter here is always bitter cold. I punched in the code for our garage door and waited long enough so that I was able to duck underneath to escape the bitter winds that the day had come with. Reaching into my pocket, I felt around for my house keys, and to my dismay, the only thing I found in my pocket was a decent-sized hole that the keys must have fallen through. None too thrilled that I had to go back out into the cold, I retraced my steps all the way back to Grandma's house, and I had no luck. I must have dropped my keys in the basement while moving the freezer. I opened the back door to my Grandma's and stepped inside. I could hear her television blasting from the front room of the house and I figured that I just wouldn't bother her, but rather just head into the basement and find my missing house keys. Without thinking, I reached for the light switch and flipped it to the on position. This time the room was flooded with light, and the first thing I noticed were the various meat hooks that were hanging from the beams in the basement. For being Grandpa's old tools, they sure looked as if they'd been used recently and some still had smears of blood on them. I looked around the room. 
and I noticed that Grandma had not only the freezer that my cousin and I had just brought down, but rather three identical freezers. They were all humming to keep frozen their contents. Except for one of them. This must be the reason that she got a new freezer, as a replacement for this one. Completely forgetting the mission about finding my keys, I stepped further into the room, noting the strange smell which seemed to thicken in my nostrils the further I went into the room. The closer I got to the silent freezer, the more potent this odd smell became. It smelled like the first stages of meat going bad. I figured that I would help Grandma out and just take the bad meat out to the garbage for her. Opening the freezer, I saw different cuts of meat, all packaged nicely. That was until I pulled up the jar that had what looked to be tongues. I knew my grandma didn't like to waste any part of an animal, but this was just gross. Sliding the jar onto the butcher's counter, I continued pulling out the packages. The last package I lifted out was oddly shaped and had a name and a date written on it, Julie, August 12th, 2018. Not knowing anyone in the family named Julie, my curiosity got the best of me and I pulled apart the twine holding the package together. Underneath the white butcher paper was a ghastly head staring unseeingly back up at me. The mouth was ajar in a ghoulish manner, and I could see she was missing her tongue. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and Find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The DeFeo Family Massacre was posted at The Unredacted. The Bronze Lady of Sleepy Hollow was by Jessica Ferry for the lineup. A Bullet and a Voodoo Doll is by Troy Taylor for American Hauntings, Inc. A Comfort was written by Lady Madonna, posted at YourGhostStories.com. UFOs and Time Distortions is by Tim Schwartz for UFO Review. Leaving the Hospital is by Weirdo Family member Louise Latham, submitted directly to Weird Darkness. To the Moon and Back was submitted anonymously to Weird Darkness. Grandma's House is by Weirdo family member Rachel West, submitted directly to Weird Darkness. The fictional horror story, I Was Born with Superhuman Abilities, is by Elaine Winters and posted at Creepypasta.com. And the fictional story, Don't Let This Be You, is written by Hikari Shimizu and it was also posted at Creepypasta.com. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. And a final thought. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? C.S. Lewis I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs> <laughs>